Bonjour. Ah, en fait, il y a plus de 20 ans que je fais un stage en Bretagne, et therefore, I will speak English. Uh, I've probably forgotten most of my French. I hope to learn it again when I'm joining um, OECD in uh, a few weeks. Um, as uh, Jakob said, we have a long history. Uh, I even left my um, research group in his capable hands when I left for going to be working more strongly with MIT and the Asian Development Bank. However, you guys seduced him from us. So, um, um, well done, but unfortunately <laughs> uh, for the Austrian research group. Today, I will be talking about uh, mostly um, my experiences of being half centered at MIT, where we think a lot about like the future of the future. Yeah. Where for us, a fully autonomous, shared, electrified um, transportation system is like done. We've been thinking about that. We're thinking about the future. On the other side, for the past three or four years, I've lived in Asia and I've worked um, to see how we can use those new technologies, uh, big data systems, new systems to understand human mobility, to leapfrog uh, Asian cities uh, in their development of their transportation systems. And what's really important for me is to show you where our expectations are or where, and where we, will, where we currently truly stand, and probably a little bit of a way forward. So, you've all heard it, we live in a data-rich world. We live in a world where everybody knows, and we can easily know where everybody is, where he goes, what he likes. A lot of data about our personal life, and especially about our mobility. Now that should be great news, for especially for Asia, because it's a people-rich world. For everybody of you who's ever stepped out on the streets of Jakarta or Bangkok or um, Laos, uh, capital city Vientiane, you've seen that. How many of you have been to Southeast Asia and some of the cities who's been to Thailand, Bangkok, Manila? Can you raise your hands? Okay, who has lived there for, let's say, more than half a year, like, like as actually lived there? Oh, great. So you probably have experienced that um, we have an enormous amount of economic development, we have an enormous amount of things moving forward, but we must not forget that while we have a people-rich world and a data-rich world, still calculating the response and it's not moving forward. We have high board and why this is. There's many reasons, but four I've been, three or four I've been working on in the last four uh, years. First of all, the issues of data collection. Secondly, the availability of analysis tools. And third, the policy implications of actually knowing more. Uh, I'll show that. Essentially, when it comes to transportation in Asia and in Asian cities, we are blindfolded. Data collection is extremely expensive. The data we have is scarce. It's fragmented. It's not shared. And therefore, we have an extreme overuse of the few data sets that are available about a little transport initiative here and a little bit of mobile phone data here and a little bit of whatever uh, information about urban infrastructure uh, there. However, we are essentially still blindfolded and the statistics, capacities and funds are way not there where they should be. Not in an overall economic sense and it's especially lacking in transport. And even if we have it, the numbers we have are about infrastructure dedicated to cars or vehicles and vehicles themselves. We hardly have information about the real mobility flow in cities where more than 40% of the transportation in Manila is, 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 is estimated to be informal. So not officially 
uh, than not official bus lines, not official uh, uh, transportation. It's, it's um, things that uh, boil beyond the surface. A second, and that has been become a real big issue for me, and we are tr currently starting a new lab at MIT to look into that, is the data analysis tools that we currently have available are not tailored to developing country context. Our American methods, and I've developed some of them with Marta uh, at, at MIT, is we say if we have three to four percent of the mobile phone data of any given city, we can give you the transportation flow of the city. We did that in Bangladesh without looking more deeply into the, into the project, and the only transportation flows we had was from the rich. But you could only understand that if you understand deep down what's in the algorithms. And there's tons of you other things like, you know, most of you go to bed with your phone. It sleeps next to you and it sleeps at the same place. That's not true for most of Asia. Your phones are bartered. Every weekend, my houseboy in Manila barters his phone to get some money to buy some beer for his friends. So you cannot rely on the patterns that are built in the algorithms to simply take them, even if they are published, and transport them to Asia. Um, and finally, knowing about data has a very powerful policy impact. Um, does anybody know, and therefore politicians usually don't like it, they don't like that we have more information and that we can easily share it. Does anybody know what this is? It's one of the most famous data visualizations that came about. What, what if I tell you that every of these rectangles is a, uh, a page of a, a book? Okay, that's the book the former defense minister in Germany, Theodor de Gutenberg, wrote. It's his dissertation. And everything you see colored is something that he plagiarized, okay? He copied and stole half of his, well, probably two-thirds of his dissertation. This rumor were going on for month and month. Everybody stood by him. And then this visualization came out. And the next day, the next day, he stepped down. Because this is something he couldn't combat anymore. Once you see the data, and once it's easily understandable for the people, then you're done. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why people don't like to go into data so much. Okay, with all this, um, I did a study with a wonderful friend from Harvard who has now moved on to uh, join IBM's Watson team, Alison Laporte Oshiro, and we looked deeper into big data for transport in Southeast Asia. We looked at the technologies that are currently used, we looked at the projects that are currently implemented and the policies to guide them. And we were especially interested in, uh, do we see and can we expect to leapfrog, that's the expectation, by using mobile phone location data uh, to be better able to uh, plan transportation systems. Uh, this is the results for it. So when we look uh, at Southeast Asia, we have absolute, I mean, little to no evident activity or discussion or initial interest in discussion in those seven countries. Uh, they are all in the implementation of technology, even in startup projects and far away in policies. We have basic pilot initiatives and pilot <laughs> policies in the Philippines and in Vietnam. I'll show you a few more about that. And of course, and I've heard you just uh, probably work, uh, we'll work together a lot more with Singapore. Uh, they are implementing complex wide scale uh, initiatives in, in Singapore. Um, we even deployed, I think two years ago with them, um, in a joint venture with MIT, fully autonomous um, vehicles for students to, um, to be uh, shuffled around on their campus. Uh, and that's now in their second or third year. A um, little bit more about the Philippines. You can see here what's currently being done. A lot of it is um, connected to Manila. Uh, and then there is, of course, a huge interest uh, um, company and, and, and the Cisco's and IBM's and probably Alstom or whatever is out there uh, looking into, into different projects and issues. However, there is no policy making looking at how to uh, relate to data, how to use it for whether it's transportation or other um, smart city initiatives on a global level. We with one exemption, um, I helped write it 
two years ago, the Philippines is now the first country in Asia who has a law for for Uber-like services, let's let's put it that like that. They call it transport network services. So they have the first regulation in Asia for this particular form, new form of uh, combining data and transportation. Um, apart from that, um, that's also something we did is the with Uber together the uh, a study of the holiday traffic uh, in the Philippines. It's been all around the news. You can easily Google it um, everywhere. Uh, what we found super interesting was Vietnam. Vietnam is actually far ahead in many of the uh, issues when it comes to use big data, new technologies in transportation. And they even, since 2009, have a law, uh, a policy, the Intelligent Transportation Systems Strategy, which is combined with a legal framework, uh, and they are uh, updating it over, over time. Um, and uh, they are implementing more and more transportation technology and transportation um, uh, monitoring and planning based on data. Um, Hanoi, Ho Chi Minh City, um, Da Nang, I'm not quite sure how far the IBM Smarter City project has come in the last two years, but I didn't have a chance to look at it. Um, so this is what you see as far as it is currently goes. It has bits and bits of projects, bits and pieces of using some kinds of technologies, and sometimes a little bit of illegal pinpricks um, when you look at it. Now, what is the impact of big data in developing cities? And why do we need those tailored methods and tools for developing countries? First of all, we simultaneously live in the Middle Ages and the future of the future. If you go to any of those cities, you probably, Bangkok, Jakarta, Manila, you probably find more advanced urban planning than you might find it in some of the new developments we do in Europe. But at the same time, 40% or 30% all over Asia, 40% in the Philippines, 100 million people, 40 million people live on less than $2 a day. A mobile phone is out of the question, not even a dumb mobile phone, not even a, a far away from a smartphone. And also, their access to the transportation system is out of the question. However, uh, and that has been amazing for me, they have, over the region, a 5.5 um, growth rate, uh, GDP growth rate. Uh, in the Philippines, it was 6.3%. You cannot imagine, uh, I think nobody of our generation can imagine how it is to live in a society that grows by more than 5% every year. That new amount of services, of uh, everything, businesses that springs up is incredible, but with it, transportation becomes an absolute nightmare, which is why we need to move in now with everything we, we have. And I'm not here to advocate for better uh, infrastructure systems for street cars, or better or autonomous driving, or bicycle sharing systems, or better pedestrians. We have to tackle everything at the same time to be able to move forward. Um, and this is the money we're currently spending, uh, we expect to spend. Uh, in, in Asia until 2030, and um, forgive me for saying that, but as soon as it starts into trillion dollars, I'm, I'm at loss anyway, whether it's 27 or 29, it's too much anyway um, for me to understand. But this is an enormous amount of money that goes in the transportation system, and very, very little currently goes into the non-car-oriented transportation system. To show you what happens if someone gets this totally wrong, the data, the technology, and the transport, I would like to take you to Ho Chi Minh City. It's a beautiful city in Vietnam, and what you have there is at most every crossing you have a policeman making the transport flow, stopping it in one direction, keeping the moving. However, of course, he doesn't know what the policeman one crossing or two crossing over does. So the actual flow in Ho Chi Minh City was not guaranteed. It was really difficult. However, that's an easy solution for any transportation um, systems provider. And in they came a very well-known international company 
that provides transportation technology services. Hand in hand with the, developing, with the development bank who provided $60 million in funding. And what they did is we make it easy, we put sensors in the ground, we wire them up to traffic lights, all of it is connected through a network to a traffic control system, and then you will have your policemen sitting in the, in the center of uh, Ho Chi Minh and probably control the transportation flow all over Ho Chi Minh City. They did that, okay? Putting in the sensors, wiring it up, putting it to traffic lights for two years. A nightmare. A nightmare in a city like this. And then, one day, they flipped the switch. And this is what happened. Complete and utter chaos. And why is this? What's the answer to this? Any, any volunteer thing? There could be many things that could have happened. No one? Unfortunately, you must have heard my presentation. <laughs> yes. Usually, everybody tells me, oh, you know, the Vietnamese, they didn't know how to use traffic lights. What actually happened is this super clever, uh, well-known uh, company, they put in magnetic field sensors. You know what magnetic field sensors count? A lot of metal that is in cars. You know what Vietnam runs on? Scooters. So everything went uh, right. The system counted the cars. However, it waited up for about, like, let's say, 60 to 100 cars to pass by before it turned to green. Unfortunately, it waited quite a while for that. And after a while, the, soccer, the, the people on the scooters were not uh, going to wait anymore. So this is when culture eats technology for breakfast. And this is a fun example, and it's an obvious example. But you know what? <coughs> I've seen spent millions and millions of dollars in a similar way by people coming f with not enough deep technology know-how, because I'm pretty sure the engineer who put in the magnetic field sensors for, uh, first in the specification said what they could count. Too little technology insights and too little cultural knowledge and no combination between it. And this is why many of the projects fail and why we are still calculating the response. Uh, I will show you now a few things. We'll be going ahead, still mostly on project levels, but uh, where we work um, to bring it to a global uh, system as well. This is first a project that was first uh, pioneered in, in Kenya, but th since then has moved on to many countries, including Cebu and Manila and the Philippines. And it's basically a method to track the informal transportation that happens in most of um, uh, Asia's or Africa cities. However, we didn't. It, it's not about generating the, ma the one map to have them once, but it was, and the biggest work that Sarah Williams, uh, a good friend from the Civic Data Design Lab at MIT did is, they got Google on board, and they first uh, came up with a GTFS standard uh, for the first inf representation of informal transportation in Google Maps, and it's called, the project is called the Data for the Rest of Us. Uh, and that is how we can do that if we don't have the same kind of data feeding into the systems like Google Maps um, as we have in the developed world. Secondly, and I've talked a little bit about this, is uh, looking at uh, Dakar has a huge transportation, has huge transportation issues. If you want to make a new public transportation system like a new bus route, you probably need to know where people go or, or don't go. And if you just used the mobile phone data and the algorithms that were published out there, uh, you get the wrong information. You know where the rich people go, but they go by car anyway with their drivers. Um, even I have a driver in Manila, and I'm far from, from being rich in, in Filipino standards. Um, so we had to really find ways to mine the data in a different way, to adjust our methods, to have researchers to really go deep down in the algorithms to make this work. Um, another area we're working, see, I'm always prepared to go to Pakistan uh, or Afghanistan. Um, 
uh, it's it's difficult there, it's dangerous there if you go there, but you still want to improve the transportation and uh, traffic systems. So here we partnered with the European Space Agency to use satellite imaging to do the first bus rapid transit uh, planning before we went down uh, there and have the real discussion uh, on spots. We since then even used it for Fiji's uh, and, and a few other uh, of the island nations to arrange for a new shipping and vessel. Uh, transportation um, system. Uh, the traffic flow monitoring system in the Philippines, it used the shared economic uh, economy data. It's a project by World Bank, Grab Taxi, and the um, Transportation Ministry in the Philippines. But what you see, uh, and, and one more, because as I told you, we're looking very much at informal transportation and not only at car transportation, if we change everything for, uh, we have currently in the bus systems or pedicab systems to cars, we're done. So um, we looked at where areas are flooded and when there's a flooding, um, pedicabs become usually the last way of resort to get uh, sick people or goods out of slum areas. But if they are submerged under flooding, uh, they cannot move, especially if you look into having some of them with uh, electric um, uh, support, um, electric motor um, engine support. Um, there we developed a new pedicab that's actually currently uh, already out there, more than 100 of those in Lumpini, Nepal. And much work of love for the last two years is to generate a transport database for Asia and the Pacific. Uh, it's still, it's still you, you cannot find all the data you want there because it's still in the test version and we, we're currently still collating data and looking at it and trying to find more. But this is to work not only on the project level that I showed you before, on a project level where we pair people who know the technology, the depth of the algorithms, the depth of the sensors very well with people who have the knowledge about the local mobility culture. And I'm not going to fund <laughs> any other project in this area or not look at anything in my research uh, groups that I lead. I don't want to work with anybody who doesn't know the area where he's working at. You're out of my group if you do that. Um, so we've been working on this um, for the last two or three years. It has launched and we have gotten a lot of um, partners on board. Uh, Asian Development Bank was leading the effort, but the International Ag Energy Agency based in Paris, IDDP, a lot of people joined to make sure we have a better understanding not only on project level, but on systems level in, in about Asian transportation data. It's still not where I want it to be, but it's a first step to show what's lacking, which is something um, we're trying to implement or hope to implement, like showing where the data is lacking to push policy or politicians also in this direction. Um, with this, uh, you've probably heard in the beginning that I'm going to join OECD because over the years I've learned more and more how important it is to get the policies right before the innovations hit the road. Um, so I'm going to look into that in the next few years a little bit more. Uh, while still keeping my research at MIT. Um, policy development, we need to look into global and national data and tech policies and build them. Uh, and I've just heard how difficult it is in France. We have to build them in where we live, but we have to have a special focus on the areas where we have a huge economic and a huge transportation growth. And ladies and gentlemen, as much as you might not like Paris transport, come to Manila for two days and you will love it. It's free flowing here. It's super nice. It's easy. I mean, I've, I don't know why Jakob was um, stressed out today. I found it quite quickly. Okay. We have to look into data, data privacy and ownership models and especially revenue models. If we want to get to the data from the private companies or to use it for public good, we have to come up with sensible models to use them. Not sell it and all our data immediately, but also find ways to do that in a, in a clever way. Sandy Pentland uh, is working on a new deal uh, on data together with the World Economic Forum, but I'm sure there's other initiatives out there. And, and this is because I know this is a research organization. 
you will never be out of job. <laughs> That's the good news about all the problems, okay? We have an enormous amount of capacity building in front of us. For us, ourselves, uh, when we say we are here at uh, Centrale Supélec de Sciences Po, or uh, MIT, or wherever, wherever we work uh, or research, um, the technology know-how of staff needs to be built, and it needs to be like the T, the really deep horizontal knowledge in one of your fields, whatever your field is, but you have to know it, and the T meaning understanding the transportation system globally, like the system behind it, but also the socio-cultural system of where you apply it. And then you make money, or you even advance, or both advance a human life there. Um, the role of IT and tech in operations and projects is extremely changing, but, and this is something that I also learned, policy makers or politicians have not understood that yet. We have very little people who are digital natives or savvy around this area. So that's my last line for today. Digital natives, not digital naives, are designing our future. And if you ask me how your future is going to be decided in Asia, Latin America, and Africa, but probably still with a huge impact by what we are thinking here in Europe and the US. And I call for a bigger partnership, but even more, I call for really understanding what you're working at and where you're working at. Thank you very much. You talked about the, the kind of reluctance you can find on, 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 on the side of politicians. Uh, my question is about um, the, the, the fact that uh, a, a large part of uh, transportation data as in, in, uh, are in the hands of private operators. How do you uh, make them accept re release this data in order to monitor the whole system. This is something I quickly jumped into when I, I showed you what Sandy Pentland or the New Deal and Tata is. We have to come up with models that, that work. A private company is not there to hand over gifts. It's there to make business. If you find a way to have a business model where they can use whatever level of data you decide on, on what anonymous, anonymizing level you decide to sell it, let's say, to Starbucks to better place their coffee shops, but at the same time, whenever they make a sa sale, they have to give it pro bono to the government to allow the government to make uh, a better use of um, uh, data to put in better bus lines. So this is this is this is this is currently really in negotiation. If you make private sales, then you also have to share it with the public, and. Uh, then we also have and we see that currently a lot of the companies are actually willing to, s to show and demonstrate how much data they have and what they can do with it. Um, I showed you partnering between Grab Taxi is far bigger than Uber in, in, in Asia. I just always use Uber instead of Lyft and all these other uh, companies because you know everybody knows that one. Um, they are happy to share and to show what they can do with it but ultimately, of course, they want money back for it. So either, either you find a way to do that, or you move on from the capitalist system. You know what, probably that might take a little while. So uh, I think we have to come up with, with things that are fair to both uses. And we had to do that and had to build institutions around this. I mean, now we have uh, institutions to monitor our food. We didn't have that um, 150 years ago. People died left and right from flour being polluted or whatever. We have to build new institutions, and this is something that I'm thinking and working on. If I, if I may give a, a piece of information about the situation, uh, the legal situation here, uh, we, have, we are having a, a reflection on uh, what we will call Données d'intérêt général, general interest data in, in, in cities. And the problem is how to, how to 
collect them. Um, we have now a piece of legislation in the last law on uh, uh, digital uh, um, uh, public action, which provides something about the situations where the transportation or public service operator <coughs> is in a position of contracting out. Then it is possible to force them to release the, the, the data. But we have no solution yet uh, in, in the other cases. Yeah, I know. I mean, the good thing about uh, living in European cities like Vienna or Paris is that we have a very good administration and we basically have a good legal, legal system and framework and lots of people are working in and keeping us, which also means everything is very entrenched and if you change one thing and look in one thing, like 500 people need to be in the negotiation. That's a little bit easier in systems that are not that strongly um, administered yet. Hi, uh, so I work for IBM. Mm -hmm. I, I work um, with a lot of uh, city planners and transportation planners in Europe. I don't know the Asian market. I, I found your, 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 your the kind of issues you raise are, are really fascinating because we are, we are kind of more disciplined here. So we, and we can we have a Jacobinist uh, culture that, 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 that helps us uh, kind of organize things. Still, wh when I work with planners, I found that they are really excited by the, uh, the advent of the data. But in the end, when they want to calibrate their models or anything, they rely on surveys. And, and, and all types of survey, and even though the, the polling is much smaller, they say it's much more useful. Because when, whenever I do a survey, like, like uh, enquête uh, ménage déplacement or, or other kinds of uh, standardized things, they say I get the reason why people are moving. And that will let me anticipate how they will behave to a different scenario that I'm putting in their hand, which big data does not give me. And, and part of this is cultural. It's just the way they did it all the time. But I think they, they, there's still something interesting in this, and I'm wondering whether there's some way to combine them to get the both. Totally. I mean, uh, today I focused on the big data because that was the request. But we are actually marry, uh, working on marrying the small data with the big data or the qualitative uh, data with the quantitative data. That's super important if you look into cities. You can learn something about a larger system. You can learn a lot about the larger undercurrents that you probably also don't see. But if you work with specific, it's, it's about the questions you ask. You can ask qualitative questions in a different way than quantitative questions. And yes, we are working on interpreting, interpreting the big data to understand um, emotional values behind it as well. But uh, this, is, this is a very important issue you raised. Uh, I recently did an interview with Rob Kitchen. He's running an ERC grant on, on the smart city future. And we are both believe that we need to bring the two cultures of urban planners and, transporta and, and, and engineering uh, sciences together to work on better cities. And I'm super happy that you say that you from IBM work <laughs> together on both things, because we both probably know that when you started the Smart Cities Initiative, and I work with Anthony Townsend, uh, you had quite a few years of uh, uh, engineers planning the cities. So that's, that's, and I think that's a big learning. I think it's a big learning. I know I've worked intimately with IBM, that some of the revenue ideas did not come about, because at that time, um, it was not clear that every city has its own system, and that selling there and its own cultural expectations would not the scalability is a different form of scalability than what you expect from um, an information back ground. Ah, by the way, I'm, I'm finishing now because Jacob looks on this, I think, but how many cities are in the world with more than 150,000 people? So how many cities are we in the end talking about? Because, you know, I like villages, but <coughs> okay. How many are out there? So in how many cities will you work? In how many cities do we have to get it right? Any, any, any ideas? Give me numbers. Two, fifty, five hundred thousand. One thousand? It's not that bad. Usually I get it a lot of. It's, it's about a little bit more than 4,500 cities in that size globally. 
And this is the cities we need to work on. It's not the 28 megalopolis cities. It's Tokyo is really fun. I've lived there for three years. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's, it's perfect and, and Rio or whatever. But it's about 4,500 cities that we actually need to be working on. Um, and that's the market for IBM and Cisco as well. Or, uh, uh, well, your, your market is a little bit bigger because you're building the mean cars. Okay, thank you very much and um, thank you for having me. <laughs>